Today I'm going to be talking about the Walksnail Fat Shark Avatar HD transmission system and goggles. There's a lot of unanswered questions which I intend to answer today. Its initial release left a lot of people's head scratching, including mine, and there is a reason for that. Cadex had a partnership with DJI selling Vistas, and just like all of us, they started to get frustrated with the lack of updates and feature requests that us, the community, were asking for, such as the ability to record the on-screen display or record anything onto the storage space of the Vista, and who can forget HDMI out? You name it, DJI wasn't listening. So Cadex decided that developing their own product and processing their own core technology would allow customer feedback and opinions to be adopted continuously to improve the product. The agreement between Cadex and DJI has expired. So what is Walksnail? It's a subsidiary of Cadex and originally was set up so that Cadex could continue selling Vistas for the community. But DJI didn't like it for obvious reasons and have parted ways. Now, don't worry, well, sort of, DJI are going to be selling Vistas through a different vendor. For how long? Well, I can't tell you anymore. I used to know when Cadex had the relationship with DJI because I could just ask them. And the next iteration of the DJI system is not going to be backwards compatible with the current air units and Vistas. Shock horror. So that was another reason to go in a different direction. And it's also why Walksnail won't bind with a Vista. They are very different systems with a similar look. And this next bit is opinion based, but I'm trying to keep that to a minimum. Judging by how DJI has parted ways with Cadex, I don't think they would have taken kindly to the avatar system binding with a Vista. And DJI the brand is going to do what DJI does. They give us what they think we want with no backwards compatibility. And as much as I love the DJI FPV system, we don't get a choice on the features that it has. So could you wait for the DJI V3 system? Sure, you're gonna have to buy all new stuff and again, when the next one comes out, that's their business model. The idea of Walksnail is that, yes, you have to buy new stuff, but the FPV community gets to decide what features we want out of a digital FPV system. And just to clarify, the only thing I know about the next DJI system is that it's not compatible with current air units and vistas. DJI stopped talking to me and every other reviewer that I'm aware of after the release of their FPV drone. Now, before you start thinking, ah, Andy's drank the Cadex Walksnail Kool-Aid, Walksnail themselves admit that this is a product in development, and that's something Fat Shark, Rotor Riot, Red Cat, or whoever should have said from the start, and not left us to realize that for ourselves. Trust is everything. You are buying into a product that has potential and full control over what features it can have, but it has some work to go. That being said, the updates are coming thick and fast, and the goal is to eventually compete with DJI, but with the missing features we all want as FPV pilots. Next, let's talk about the Fat Shark and Walksnail partnership. Fat Shark manufacture the goggles and Walksnail make the video transmission system. So whether you buy the Avatar goggles or the Walksnail goggles, they are exactly the same, apart from the color. You get a different style carry case with the Avatars and they ship with antennas, but the goggles themselves are the same. There was something going around about the Avatar goggles accepting 6S and the Fat Shark 5S, but that's not true. They are both 5S. 
there's also an uncertainty about the warranty, so I will clear that up too. The Avatar has a 15-day return policy and not a 15-day warranty. Both the Fat Shark Dominators and the Avatars have a two-year warranty on the goggles and a one-year warranty on the VTX. The difference being, if you buy Fat Shark and have an issue, then the goggles have to be sent to Fat Shark. And if you have an issue with the Avatar goggles, they have to be sent to Walk Snail. But if the issue is with the Walk Snail system itself, whether it be the VTX or VRX, then currently the system ends up at Walk Snail. You just might have to go through Fat Shark first for it to get there. Now, I have no contact with Fat Shark, only Walk Snail. But to me, it would make sense if Fat Shark eventually have the ability to fix the Walk Snail side as well. For example, there's a current issue where if you pull the battery out of the goggles while updating the firmware, it can brick the goggles. In that scenario, Currently, where the Fat Shark or Avatar, the goggles get sent to Walk Snail, whereas the Avatars go straight direct to Walk Snail. That issue is being worked on, and I'm sure you all know if you want to get your fingers dirty, FPV.WTF have a DIY solution. But personally, I would just send the goggles back because there are some ribbon cables inside the goggles that can break easily. There is an outstanding question I had, and that's if Fat Shark manufacture the goggles, wouldn't it make sense to send the Avatar goggles to Fat Shark if, say, an OLED fails? But the current system is that Avatar goggles go to Walk Snail and Fat Shark goggles go to Fat Shark. Unlike DJI, the goggles only transmit on one antenna, and the rest are all receivers. The way that it works is as soon as the goggles are plugged in, they start transmitting, and the VTX looks for that signal before it starts transmitting video back to the goggles. So you have to be very careful when flying around others, and it also means that you need to make sure that your antennas are on the goggles before powering up. I'm told that for a short while, no damage will be done, but if you are blasting 1200 milliwatts without an antenna, then you will damage it. That's something I would like to see changed. Now, Cadex partnered up with Fat Shark because they needed a goggle manufacturer to showcase the system, and as much as I'm not a fan of Fat Shark, before the DJI system came out, I always recommended Fat Sharks for their repair service and warranty. And now that Red Cat owns them, I have no idea what that service is like these days, so I would love some feedback on that in the comments from you. Back when everything was analog, my goggles were breaking every six months because I was sometimes using them an hour a day. So they will get sent to Dave in the UK and be back to me within five days. And I don't know if that infrastructure is still in place because I don't use the HDO2s as much. The only goggle I thought Fat Shark completely nailed was the HDO2s, and it does look like those optics have made it into this goggle. But I think I'm going to do a separate video on the goggles because this one is more about answering questions that have been floating around for far too long and hindering its potential. Cadex aren't locked into Fat Shark, and they are going to be working on a standalone VRX eventually that can be used with other goggles. A standalone VRX would also resolve the complaint that the Fat Shark goggles or the Avatar goggles don't have an AV in. It was just quicker to work with a partner because it's a lot of work for them. 
My personal worry is that Fat Shark has previous when it comes to ditching analog and digital FPV systems, so let's hope that they don't follow that trend. But at least the standalone VRX could remove that issue from the equation. Now, at this point, I could do a comparison between DJI and Walksnail, like I'm sure many people are doing right now. But to me, that's a bit pointless because new firmwares are coming out all of the time. And while it might make great clicks, those comparisons will become out of date very quickly. For example, the Walksnail system uses the H.265 codec for compression, also known as HEVC or High Efficiency Video Coder, whereas DJI, the current system, uses H.264 or AVC, known as Advanced Video Coding. Codec is short for code and decode. Both H.264 and H.265 are used to compress video into smaller file sizes. H.265 is the successor of H.264 and it's not widely used yet as a video codec because while it's much better producing the quality of H.264 and better at much lower bit rates, it requires more processing power to do it, especially at higher resolutions. For example, let's say you made a advert for somebody with a drone and sent them a 4K H.265 file. There's a good chance it would stutter and not play smoothly, whereas H.264 would. I think on Windows, if you are living life legitimately, you actually have to pay 99p for the H.265 codec, whereas it's native on Mac, and Mac currently processes H.265 better than Windows as well. H.265 should not need 25 megabit or 50 megabit per second to produce an image the same as H.264, which DJI is currently using. So the Walksnail system needs a lot more refining. Without going into too much detail, the idea of compression is to compare previous frames against future ones and only encode what has changed. And intracode blocks from previous frames, meaning that the raw data can be discarded, resulting in much smaller file sizes and less bandwidth required. So, if you are talking to a camera like me and the background is still, it's not going to keep the raw data in the background. Instead, it will compress it while at the same time retaining the video quality and focusing on the main subject. H.264 is much less efficient at doing this than H.265 because H.264 uses 16 by 16 blocks, previously known as macro blocks, with less processing on top and less tuning options for different use cases to identify the best way to compress an image. H.264 has nine prediction compression options, whereas H.265 has 35 and uses 64 by 64 blocks, which can be split down and partitioned in many different ways to better suit different use case scenarios, such as FPV. So even when there's more going on in the video itself, H.265 can produce a better image requiring less bandwidth and smaller file sizes. This is why streamers and streaming services are starting to use it, and H.264 will eventually die a death. And it's why it should be better for FPV, because essentially it's a streaming service from a quadcopter to eyes. The limitation with H.265 is hardware, and can it perform these extra processes that are required? 
But going back to the 25 megabit and 50 megabit question, if you encode H.264 and H.265 at the same bit rate, you will get almost the same file size and use up the same amount of bandwidth. So this needs to be looked at. Because what we are seeing at the moment is that Avatar just about matching or slightly underperforming DJI, depending on your opinion. Next, let's talk about latency. And this is where the Avatar goggles have a limitation over DJI. The Avatar goggles have OLEDs in them with a refresh rate of 90 Hertz. But the DJI goggles have a refresh rate of 120 Hertz when used with a Vista or Air unit. The V2 DJI goggles actually have a refresh rate of 144 Hertz, but not when used with Air units and Vistas. Now, when it comes to smoothness and frames per second, the human eye can't perceive above 60 hertz or 60 frames per second. Some will argue for days, but in this case, it's not important. The reason you see gaming monitors with a 120 hertz refresh rate or 240 hertz is not to have a smoother image, the reason is latency from the screen to the eyes. And this was explained to me by DJI before they stopped talking to me. So if you think I'm wrong, then go hate on DJI. A 90 hertz refresh rate refreshes the screen 90 times a second with a latency of 11.1 milliseconds. But 120 hertz has a latency of 8.3 milliseconds and DJI explained to me that the 120 hertz refresh rate was tied to the low latency mode in the system and I think this is why you may see a discrepancy with what the walk snail software reports compared to real world tests however this is early days and there are other ways to reduce latency which for now I don't think it's worth my time doing those tests. The leather style removable face cushion that Fat Shark have used on their previous goggles tends to wear out and tear. So I asked Walksnail whether this will be available as a spare part and the answer was eventually yes. And I imagine other companies will make their own version of it and try and improve on it as well. The same goes for the goggles strap. It's public knowledge that they are working on a 1S VTX for whoops. And I know FPV.WTF found code for a third VTX. But Walksnail say there is not a third VTX currently in the pipeline. Despite what you may have seen, the VTX does actually have a thermal cutoff at 120 degrees Celsius. The new firmware will warn you when it reaches 100 degrees, which it shouldn't get anywhere near to if you have the correct airflow. It does have a standby mode, which is the same as temperature control mode on DJI. In other words, when it's not armed, it will sit at a lower power output to stop the VTX from overheating. There's some other stuff which is public knowledge, such as sorting out a four by three aspect ratio, being able to record the on-screen display directly in the goggles rather than it just outputting it to the HDMI, which by the way, until that's sorted, I picked up a digit now 1080p 60 FPS recorder for $20 on eBay, albeit second hand, but it's probably just best to wait until they have sorted it out in the code. Something that separates Walk Snail from DJI at the moment is that DJI have their own dedicated controller, which means you don't need a separate receiver. As it stands, that's not currently a priority with Walk Snail. But when I asked the question, the answer was yes, 
we can maybe do that, but it will need time. They are currently focusing on other things, such as communicating with Express LRS and making it compatible with KISS and FETTECH. I suggested that it would make sense to have a more open source approach, at least on the software side, because there are some extremely talented people in this hobby, such as FPVWTF or Express LRS, to name a few. And it seems like they are going down that route. They are working on communicating directly with the goggles via a control link as well as being able to control action cameras through the goggles menus, which is all really exciting stuff. Share mode or audience mode is being worked on. It currently doesn't work. And a fixed latency mode, which could be a game changer for some people if it's refined enough, is in the works. You see, this is the benefit of having a dedicated FPV company at the wheel rather than a multinational corporation who can dictate to you what they think you want while grabbing a load of cash at the same time. On a side note, I think all of this is great. Walk snail. HD0, DJI, wherever your preference lies, I think we are really lucky and it's an exciting time for FPV. Now gathering this information has taken a lot of time. I've been working on it since the start and could have probably released it when everyone else did, but there was just too much missing information for me to be fair to the product. So if you appreciate what I do, you can support me on Patreon or give me a super thanks. Or if you want to buy the system, there's an affiliate link in the video description as well as a pinned comment. And I would much appreciate your support. Look out for lots more content on this. I've reviewed every goggle under the sun, so I think I can bring you some content much like this that you might not find anywhere else. And as always, thanks so much for watching. Please continue to subscribe. Cheers.